and welcome to another World of UX podcast. This is your host, Darren Hood. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to join us. And a special welcome to all of you who are tuning in for the first time. Welcome to the World of UX podcast, where we talk about everything associated with user experience. We don't just talk about how to do the work, but we talk about the challenges. We talk about the pitfalls. We talk about the trends. We talk about any and everything associated with user experience. God forbid we only focus on the work. Uh, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people do that. But when you do, when you run into one of those other things, then now what? Uh, you're not going to figma your way out of that. You're not going to you're not going to going to uh, portfolio your way out of every situation. And so there's uh, that that mindset is something that is becoming really dominant in UX circles today, and I'm here to help offset that. I'm here to be a voice of reason. I'm here to help folks. I'm here to point people in the right direction. Uh, Someone someone might say, well, Darren, are you gatekeeping? Actually, yeah, I am. Uh, But please know and understand what gatekeeping is. Gatekeeping is about quality. It's about quality assurance. It's about quality advocacy. It's about helping people to understand what constitutes quality in every discipline in the world, every successful discipline has gatekeeping. Every successful discipline relies on that gatekeeping. Every successful discipline respects gatekeeping. And we are where we are today, and we see this wild, wild west of UX today because there's a lot of people who don't respect gatekeeping. They don't value it. They don't embrace it. So yeah, I am here to do that, and I'm not ashamed of it. And I'm proud to say that I'm doing that and I'm not backing off of it. Uh, it, It's time for the neurotic people to lose their their G.I. Joe Kung Fu grip, if you will. I'm probably telling my age by saying that. (laughs) But uh, it's time to stop doing that, folks. It's, It's time to stop worrying about what you're measuring up to and then find out what we're supposed to measure up to, like we all used to do, and then measuring up to that. Being accountable, embracing accountability. The, these are good things. These are mature things. These are wise things for us to do. And so we talk about all those things on this podcast, and we are not going to shift. <laughs> not for anybody. The only people who are concerned about gatekeeping are the people who know that they do not and will not measure up to standards. So uh, so that's, we, we wave bye-bye uh, to those people. We don't worry about that at all. We started off with the anniversary. This is the fourth anniversary of the podcast. And we started off last week by giving an oversight of UX history. And and, and that was supposed to be the first of four topics I was going to cover in the potpourri segment. And for those of you that are new, uh, anytime you see UX potpourri in the title, that means we're just going to talk about random topics. And there was so much to cover last week that I just decided to keep that separate. We are going to attempt to cover the other three topics today. There, we might veer off and touch on a couple other things here and there, but we're going to try to finish what we started last week, and then we're going to get into, hopefully, some of the interviews that we had on tap to share as part of the fourth anniversary celebration for the show. So let's get into the rest of those topics, shall we? Topic number two. The second topic that we were going to cover last week had to do with how a lot of people in and around UX today, this usually comes up with hiring managers or people who are questioning who we're going to hire, not necessarily a hiring manager, but a person who's participating in that process. A lot of times people will concern themselves with the length of time somebody has on a particular job. And, and if you just, just go out to LinkedIn, do a search, a random search. Look at random profiles. Look at the profiles of your connections. Look at the the length of stints that people have at organizations. And one of the things you will find out is that uh, a lot of times what you will see is one to two years. People are at an organization for one to two years and they move. Every once in a while, you'll find somebody three to four and leave the fang folks out of it. Leave the 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 Amazons and the Meta slash fake Facebooks and all those companies. Leave them out of it because, especially Amazon, 
because the way that Amazon hires and the way that Amazon rolls out their pay scale and their bonus uh, 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 component of their hiring, a lot of people actually stay at Amazon for a longer period of time, not because they like working there. <laughs> and, um, let's, let's get that out there for people to know and understand. And we're going to talk about Fang in a little bit, one of the other topics. People stay there because if they, they go there, they find out it's not what they thought it was. In a lot of instances, are there happy people there? Absolutely. Are there a lot of unhappy people there? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are. Let's get that out there. Fang is overrated, folks. It's overrated. Working for these big name companies, it's overrated with regard to who's working there, the assumption that the work they do is quality, the whole nine yards, all that stuff is not true. It, it is casting a, an indirect dispersions upon people because they have not worked in one of those organizations. But a lot of those people stay there because they don't want to pay the bonus back. So they, they stay in this uncomfortable situation. They stay in an unhappy situation. A lot of those people are quiet quitting, truth be told, because they don't like it, but they don't want to pay the bonus back. So they're trying to wait and to leave until they can not have to worry about paying the bonus back. So for those of you that didn't know that, there it is. We just busted on a lot of people. And again, that, that's what we do on this show. There's a lot of things people don't want to talk about because they're afraid. Cowardice is rampant in UX today. Frankly put, a lot of people are, uh, they just don't want to be the one that says certain things. They don't want to suffer any consequences for saying certain things. And I'm not talking about consequences, like, like legitimate consequences. It's the cowardice thing. They just don't want to be the one to say it. So they leave it to people like me. I'm going to say it because I care, not because I want to start something, not because I want to be a rebel rouser, not because I want to stir the pot or rock the boat. I just care. I, I, I just don't want to see people in a situation where they're, they're they have these incorrect perceptions because it just it, it's just going to set you up for failure. Understand what you're getting into. You want to get into UX, you're new to UX, understand what you're getting into. Don't believe the hype. Oh, this work is easy. Anybody can do it. Understand what that really means. Anybody can do the work means that if you put your mind to it and you put in the proper work and you really fall in love with it, yeah, you can do it. Not anybody can do it. It doesn't take anything. That's not true. And unfortunately, a lot of people who believe that are getting the jobs today and they'll do anything to get a UX job. They will lie. They will cheat. They will steal. And this is actually, this is literal. I'm not, these are not, I'm not coining phrases. I'm not, I'm not do, uh, presenting metaphors. People are lying, cheating, and stealing to get into UX roles because they like the paycheck. They don't like the work, and I say it often. People want a UX job, but they don't want to do the UX work. And when they're dealing with somebody who does not know how to properly evaluate UX talent, guess what's going to happen? They're going to get hired, and they're going to come in. I, I talked recently in the Sinister series about people, the way that, and told you we'd get into a couple of the topics. Well, here we are. Uh, there, there, there are people who talk about having mentors. A lot of these so-called mentors are not really mentors. A lot of the mentors in UX are like, they're like proxies. There, there are people that, that don't do the UX work, don't want to do the UX work, know they don't want to do the UX work. And so they take these people that they call mentors. And they present these quote unquote mentors with something they're trying to do at work. And the mentor gives them answers. They tell them what they would do. They tell them what they should do. The person who has the job that's getting the paycheck is really just a, a marionette. They're a puppet. And the so-called mentor is pulling strings and telling the person what to do. The person goes back and does what the so-called mentor tells him to do. And the manager and other people on the team have no idea unless you're seasoned and you can, you can read between the lines and you can see what's really happening. Because ironically, a lot of those people, they never solve problems if you're working as a team and trying to work on something. They never contribute because they can't. They'll, they'll fake it till they make it. A lot of people believe that. 
they'll they'll throw something out there to look like they're participating, but they never do come up with anything substantive. They never come up with anything useful. They never come up with anything concrete. Why? Because they're getting all their answers from their so-called mentor. This is rampant. This is I, I, I starting to come across this more and more in UX circles. And then there's this contingent. I talked about this recently, too, in the Sinister series. These people who have this code of silence where they just don't think we should be talking about certain things. And those people don't want you to talk about certain things because, one, they don't know anything about it. So they don't want to show that they're ignorant. So they just say, well, let's just not talk about it when the truth is they can't talk about it. So they want the people that are talking about it to stop. So they stop looking stupid. <laughs> hey, I'm busting on everybody. So what? That there are people, they have this code of silence. They don't, some people don't want you to say anything because they're embarrassed. They don't want you to say anything because they just don't want to have to deal with the reality. They don't want to have to deal with the embarrassment that they can't see it, that they've overlooked it. it, it there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Anyway, that that's all that is side notes. Let's get back to the main point. People are concerned. Some people are concerned when they see short stints. I have a lot of short stints and people will ask me a lot. And, and I know other people in the same boat as myself. They'll ask you, well, were, were these contract roles? They'll they'll they, they get concerned. Well, I don't I hope this person isn't a job hopper. Job hopping is not the only reason people have short stints. Contract roles are not the only reasons, legitimate reasons that people have short stints. And so when somebody looks at short stints and then they assume that it's for some type of, of, of degrading or negative, this is one of the times I will use the word negative because I don't like that word, that they, something problematic. They think it's, they assume that short stints are due to something problematic. And that's not necessarily the case. And, and only a critical thinker is going to say, you know, it might be something else. I've talked to people where I've been very transparent. You can't be extremely transparent with everybody because everybody will say, bring your genuine self, bring your authentic self. And then you bring your authentic self and you find out how authentic that person is. Because when you bring your authentic self to somebody who's not emotionally intelligent, they don't know how to deal with authentic selves. So I, I highly recommend that you be careful where you show your authentic self and learn who people are before you share your authentic self. Me, I love being transparent. I don't want to be somewhere where I can't be my authentic self. I'm not going to put on a front. I'm not going to be three versions of myself. I'm not going to do that. that that's ridiculous. It's not healthy. It, it's not psychologically sound. And some people, they want to be two or three people because they're always hiding something or they want to be two or three people because they're embarrassed about their authentic self. And some people uh, want to be someone different, depending upon, they want to be a chameleon. And I mean that in a bad sense, because they just want to do whatever it takes to preserve self. And, and th these things are all problematic. And somebody who's just listening to the podcast for the first time, they, Darren, have you talked about UX at all? Is this guy for real? Yeah, I am for real. And I am talking about UX. Please don't let it be 70 years down the road before you find out that everything I'm talking about is relevant. And for those of you not familiar with me, I have been around for almost 30 years and I have seen this discipline mature. I have seen this discipline grow. I have seen this discipline evolve. The funny thing about the evolution that I've seen, it's not evolving the way that people who've been around for two years that are all over social media telling, talking about the evolution of UX and evolution they haven't seen. If somebody's only been around for two, three, four, five years, they can only tell you about the two, three, four, five years that they've been around. And that even goes for people who've been around seven, eight, nine years, 10 years even. What have you seen in 10 years? The discipline came under siege in 2011 to 2012. That's when the boot camps launched. That's when people started trying to lie to get these roles. They weren't lying. You could lie in 2008. You weren't going to get a role because everybody could see through you. Everybody knew how to evaluate talent. And, and, and that comes with an asterisk because I actually found out recently, I love looking at profiles on LinkedIn. And I came across additional people who worked in UX for two, three years. And then somebody, 
because they you have these situations where companies need somebody to be in charge and they just found the best person they could find and put them in charge. And there weren't a lot of people that could go into UX leadership roles in 2003, 2005, 2008, 2010. So that's why a lot of times you did see somebody who didn't have a, a history in UX, uh, a a sizable, for lack of a better word, a sizable history in the discipline. And so you would see that a lot. But the truth about quick rises still applies. Whether a person, and I mean, I call those people retrofits. I, I, I There's classifications, posers, retrofits, and upstarts. And the retrofit is the person that got slid into a role, a UX role, whether it's leadership or not. And they sort of like inherited that promotion because they were the best thing going at the time. They weren't really qualified. They didn't really bring a lot to the table. They didn't have a lengthy history in the discipline. And in some cases had no history in the discipline, but they were just the best option at that time. And don't let it be a situation where they needed to fill the role quickly. If they had to fill the role quickly, and and you have the best thing going and slid that person in. That person needs to count their blessings. They need to realize that they didn't deserve to be there. But a lot of those people still, I've seen people, I've come across profiles of people who have come up, been in a leadership role, directors, managers for a long time, but they never qualified in the first place and never really grew into the role. They never develop an appreciation for UX. They never really developed a love for UX. It's always, for many of those people, it's always been about the big check. It's always been about the faking it till you make it. It's always been about convenience and self-preservation. So the discipline itself never was a focal point with that individual. And those people, I've seen those people on social media, spewing this information. I've seen those people because you have people who rally around them and, and, and it's almost like a mutual admiration society because there's nothing genuine about the admiration. These people are in these positions of authority, in a position of leadership, but they you can go to their profile, look at their posts, whether, whether they're top-notch people or not. Be in the business. When you connect, don't, don't do what I call recently blind connecting. When you connect with somebody on social media, do it for a reason. Have your expectations in a proper place. Have the right expectations. Don't, 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 don't just have on rose colored glasses and I'm there and I just want to expect the best. Don't expect the best. Be realistic about it and don't be afraid to be realistic. Look at their posts. Look at what people like. Look at the comments and you'll find out what are they really sharing? Are they sharing things of value? Are they sharing things that let you know they're actually an ignoramus, <laughs> as the three students might say? It's this. This is just real stuff. This is real stuff, and, and we gotta we gotta face this because people are saying stuff that is absolutely ridiculous. But I said all that to say this: just because somebody has not been in a position for a long time, when people start making assumptions. It, it, it's funny, on one hand, they'll start making assumptions about some people, and then they'll look at somebody else and they'll give the person the benefit of the doubt. It becomes a vehicle for discrimination. Just if the person is qualified, isn't that where we're supposed to start? If a person is qualified to do the work, if a person actually has the proper skill, isn't that what's supposed to matter? I'm I'm really thankful for the fact that a lot of the bigger organizations are not afraid of people with short stints. And, and something else I found before I get to the main point, I still haven't told you what the actual topic associated with this is. I'll tell you that in a few moments. It's really funny how that a company, what, one of the things, what I was about to say was that companies that know that they have something to offer you, me, as an employee, but we're looking for certain things. Companies that actually have something to offer, I have found they are less likely to be afraid of a person with short stints. And if you're a hiring manager, hiring managers listen to my show. And if you're a hiring manager and it, maybe you haven't done this yet, I've seen people do it. I've done it. When I was a hiring manager, 
Talk to that person who has a short stance. Get it out there on the table. Talk about it. Encourage them to be candid. Encourage them to be transparent. Find out what's going on. I had somebody ask me once, what would it take? We, we know you've had these short stints. We'd love to have you here. What would it take in your mind to stay with this company for a long time? What would that, because truth, and, and using myself again as a, as a model, I have short stints, shorter stints, but I also have long stints with certain companies too. And why did I stay with those companies for a long time? Why did I stay with another company for a short period of time? And, and I just going down memory lane here, the company that asked me, what would it take? I actually had more than one company ask me that. What would it take for you to stay for a long time? But the one that comes to mind the most, they asked me what it would take for me to stay there. And I told them. And you know what? They didn't provide it. And I left. And, and there has to be self-respect. When it comes to longevity, if you're in a company and they're disrespecting you, you're in a company, they're taking advantage of you. You're in a company. I worked for a company once where there was a white supremacist that worked with the company and, and he was behaving as if it was his job to abuse me, to subject me to all types of mental abuse. And it was ridiculous. This guy abused me during the interview. And I told our manager about it and he did nothing and then turned around and hired the guy. How crazy is that? Now, tell me if you were in that situation, whether you're male, female, whatever you're, whatever you are, whatever is going on with you, your race, your creed, whatever it is, your religion. And if you work for someone, because people are critical of me about this kind of stuff. If, if there, if you came across somebody and you interviewed somebody, I wasn't the hiring manager. I was just on the team that was interviewing. Say, put yourself in my shoes. If you were interviewing someone and that person zeroed in on you and began to subject you to abuse during the interview and that company still not only turned around and hired that person, basically signing off because he knew what he did during the interview. And I'm sure he found out that I was concerned about what he did to me during the interview. So they basically empowered that individual to subject me to abuse. And boy, did they come through to the extent that when I left that company and HR knew that that was a main reason that I was leaving that company, I guess they were afraid that they were going to get sued because they knew about it and they did nothing. The apologies that I was receiving, it was almost like, it was being preemptive. <laughs> it was like they were trying to make sure that they didn't have to worry about me coming back and, and suing that company because of what I was. I'm not going to give you any of the examples. I'm, I'm keeping it real high level here for this show. I, I don't want to out anybody. I don't want to create any issues for anybody. And, and only certain people know what company I'm talking about. Uh, but that was some really sad stuff to have to go through that. again putting yourself in my shoes, would you then, would you stay at that company? What would you do? Would you just sit and tolerate it? If you would, something's wrong. You cannot allow yourself to be subjected to that type of maltreatment. You have to take some kind of action. I mean, reasonable, humane, professional action, which in some cases includes going somewhere else. I mean, I, I realized the company apparently loved that. The company wasn't going to do anything about it. I have learned over the course of my career, it's not a good idea. A lot of times, a lot of us know. Some people can go to HR, some people can't. And if you go to HR, some companies, you just put a bullseye on your back. And, and a lot of us know that, so you can't do it. So are you going to then, because this is the reason I had to leave that organization. I can't share that when I'm interviewing. So my hands are tied. I hope people can, can relate to this. And I hope you appreciate my, my transparency because I don't have to talk about this. I don't have to say this. Do you, do you understand why? It, it's, it, I, I've, I've talked about certain things that I have encountered in my work history and, and jaws just drop. People just look and they can't believe you went through that and you did what? Oh, and by the way, I excel at my work. 
no matter what I'm subjected to. You know why? Because people pay me to do a job and I take that I, I, I take that seriously and I take pride in what I do. I take pride in my value proposition. I have two master's degrees related to UX. I have X number of years of experience. I, I'm going to come in. I need to represent that, whether they understand it or not, whether they appreciate it or not, wh- whether they're going to support me or not. So, so this is my commitment, just like I talk about in my TED Talk about excellence. This is my commitment to excellence. And I encourage other people out there, be committed to excellence, but know the cost, know the challenges, be willing to respect yourself, respect your coworkers, respect your company, respect your team, respect your customers, respect your users, but, but respect yourself and don't allow yourself. I mean, I, I don't, when a company doesn't know what they have, not, not an optimal situation. Let me reel myself in. <laughs> I said all that to say this. I read an article. I wish I could find it. It's probably been taken down. I have searched high and low to find this article. And I can't remember even who the author was and what their background was and what gave legitimacy to their statement. But what I learned, and, and I understand it now, a lot of hiring managers don't. I tell people now, too, why do you have short stats? Well, and here's what I've been trying to say. The whole time I'm finally going to say it, being somewhere for a long time in UX, a UXer's time on the job, the person equated it to dog years, as somebody might call it, or the years of a dog's life. And in a dog, dog, dog's life, was it one year or something like this? I'm a cat person, so I have cats, and sometimes I get the numbers mixed up, so I'll just estimate it and ride with me. But one year for a dog is equal to seven or eight years, something like that. So uh, a a seven year old dog or a ten year old dog is actually seven years old or seventy, seventy years old, seven zero, approximately, because I can't remember the number. So we'll just say it's approximately. And UX is the same. So when a person is at a job for one year, it's like having been there for seven, and and it's due to the things that we have to deal with, because how many other disciplines are people trying to take their work from them? How many other disciplines are trying to do their work and running into pitfalls and roadblocks everywhere? How many disciplines do not have a champion and are trying to accomplish goals to support the business and then evangelizing for for the discipline at the same time, the, the, what we do and oh, an asterisk, a lot of people that are coming into UX today, they don't do any of those things. So they don't even understand it yet, which is another reason why companies bring, they're starting to favor, bring inexperienced people in so they don't have to deal with it. So they just bring in this person who'll just do what they say. But if you're just doing what people say, if you're just an order taker, you're not a UXer yet, not a genuine one. Anyway, we do so much that there has to be, this is why it's so complex. It, UX is, is an extremely complex discipline that is calling for people to pivot, to not wear your feelings on your sleeve, to be thick skin. Not that you don't have to do it in other disciplines, but we are the baby in the, and I, when you go to a meeting, the UX person in the room or persons in the room is, is going to be the baby. Uh, we're the only one that nobody understands. We're the only one that other people, again, are trying to take our work from us, trying to do our job. We're the only one whose work is being democratized or somebody's proposing that it be democratized. The, all these things make doing our work that much more challenging, that much more difficult. And because of that, a person can't just say it's not like being on the job as a project manager for a year. It's not the same. It's not the same as being on a job for a year as a as a as an engineer or a developer. It's not the same. UX is different. And folks need to understand that. So, you know what? I did it again. 
<laughs> we, I, uh, we're, we're roughly 30 minutes into this episode, and I've spent all this time, for the most part, talking about dog years. And I'm going to keep it short. So what we're going to do, I'm going to end it here. I'm, I'm not going to address those other topics. I keep trying. I can't do it. That'll be okay. Uh, but what I'm going to do, we're going to have an interlude again. We're going to have an, uh, an intermission, if you will, from the potpourri. I'm going to end this episode here in talking about dog years. I think we've said enough. And then we're going to get into some of the interviews. And even if I get into the rest of this potpourri on the other side of the interviews, that'll be fine. Uh, but I hope you got a lot out of this. I hope, especially for those of you that are newer in the discipline, I hope this helps to give you a bit more of an understanding. A uh, big shout out to an anonymous person that thanked me for what I talk about on the show. They just got their first UX job and they thanked me for helping them to keep a level head through the process, through the things I'm talking about on the podcast. So shout out to that ind individual. They know who they are. Uh, all, everything, uh, big, big, big love to that individual. Big shout out. Uh, we're, we're, we're happy for you. We are ecstatic. We are celebrating vicariously through you today. And we're wishing more success for more people. I do get testimonials from people on a regular basis. And, and I just had to share that particular one. I'm just really ecstatic really happy. And I'm happy not only did that person get their first UX job, but they're willing to go in there and they are courageous enough to go in there and do UX the right way, which a lot of people are afraid to do. They just want to do whatever they have to do to keep the paycheck coming. And that is, it is hurting our discipline today. So more power to all those out there willing to do the right thing. But folks, that is all the time that we have for today. So thank you again for tuning in and be on the lookout for those new interviews coming up next week. Got some great surprises for you in store, some really fiery, wonderful and informative conversations. But until next time, it is time to sign off. So this is Darren Hood, the host of The World of UX, wishing everyone all the best out there. And until next time, happy UXing, everybody.